Undead dragons are a hot topic and I'm often requested to make a video about them. So grab yourself a tasty beverage, get nice and comfortable. We're about to get deeply nerdy. Dragon Magazine issue 234 published in October 1996 is packed full of articles on the undead. It's a great read, particularly the articles on magic items used by liches, which inspired a previous video of mine, and an article on items that can be used by slayers of the undead. However, our focus will be on the extensive article on undead dragons written by Jamie Nossel, subtitled The Lesser Evils of Draconian Undead. Slightly misleading, I would argue there is nothing lesser about how evil undead dragons are, and the article only really applies to true dragon undead. It specifically states that dragonettes, wyverns, dragons, and things like draconians, spell scales, kobolds, and dragonborn are also excluded. But not dragon turtles, who are still true dragons. In this video, we shall be taking a look at dragon skeletons, zombies, ghouls, whites, vampires, and the incorporeal undead such as the dragon ghost, wraiths, and spectres. I won't be talking much about draculiches, they deserve their own videos. So in the Dragon Magazine article, it talks a fair bit about what is required for a high-level necromancer to perform the raising of an undead dragon. It's certainly not easy. It's extremely expensive, requires a lot of willpower to overcome the powerful will of the dragon spirit. And the more advanced the type of undead attempt it is, the more difficult it becomes. So it seems that most rituals to raise undead dragons are performed by powerful groups of necromancers, as evidenced by the notorious cult of the dragon in the Faerun world setting. Personally, I don't bother with all those extra rules mechanics unless it applies directly to a player character attempting to perform that sort of ritual. It really just comes down to me as the dungeon master deciding if some non-player character necromancers can manage it or not. Why would I make myself do math and roll dice for that? Well, it may be handy to know just how valuable the spell components are and the time required for the ritual. Again, this is entirely for the benefit of the player characters who may be trying to attack the cult when they are performing the ritual and are at their most vulnerable all for the purposes of working out the value and nature of the loot they grab after the battle, if they survive. Not just the components of the ritual are valuable, the spell books, tomes, rune tablets and such are also extremely rare and valuable. This is not common knowledge, there are a great number of forces who would destroy any evidence of dragon raising rituals when they find them, and precious few humanoid races have ever come up with the reliable methods that don't require enormous personal power and sacrifice. So it's likely that these rituals have their origin in ancient and mythical times. For example, the Airy, the avian creator race, rulers of the Airy empires from minus 31,000 DR, Dale Reckoning, and creators of the Arakoka, Kenkru, and other avian humanoids, were dominant on the world of Toril in the early days of the first dragons. If you can find any of the vanishingly rare remnants of the Airy, you will see that this species, who arose after the fall of the Petrarchy amphibians, actually look like a cross between dinosaurs and birds. Some say they formed the missing link between the first creator race, the dinosaur or, or sauroid saruk, and the dragon and avian branches of evolution. Of course, on Toril, evolution usually was at the hands of sapient and powerful species who uplifted other primitive forms as their own servitor races. Many argue that humans are the most current creator race, being responsible for an explosion of mage-bred creatures, many of which have formed their own early cultures and may go on to become civilizations in their own right. Anyway, ultimately, the Airy were brought to ruin by the dragons. The Lamazu, a race native to the ethereal plane, didn't really get involved in the later era when true dragons emerged, but there is no doubt that ritual magics over 30,000 years old rest in lost libraries in the vast and numerous deep ethereal demiplanes they control. Also, there are lots of links to the demon lord Yenogu and many conflicts between Knolls and Aeri. Study of the infamous Nether Scrolls will reveal that nearly all the early lore and rituals involving dragons and the development of the early draconic language is all from the era of the Aeri. The impact they have had, therefore, on the basis of all spell and ritual magic practiced on Faerun is fundamental. These days, the Arakoka and Kenku birdfolk are the last living remnants of the airy species. They're also responsible for all wyverns and the monstrous owlbears. Oh, I should also mention it's highly likely ancient tombs of powerful giant warlords and heroes would contain spells and rituals to raise undead dragons. The genocidal war that the giants and dragons waged against each other knew no limits for brutality, and the giants certainly would have raised up any dragons they cut down and sent them into battle beside them and against other living dragon foes. So, 
you can now, as the dungeon master, add some historically accurate weirdness to these ancient rituals by imagining what bird folk or giant necromancers would have been like. Did they dance in ritual patterns with complex songs that drew on the weave and the powerful energies of the elemental plane? Did the rituals require elaborate robes and hats with rare, bright and outlandish decorative features? Did all the participants have to dance in circles with a great nest of arcane and divine power? Did the airy use magic circled inscriptions? Did giants practice sacrifice of living beings? It's a good opportunity to give your players a really fantastic show. All Magic contains a view in the ancient past of Toril. It's one aspect of the world setting I really love to think about. Those who seek to raise dragons need a dragon corpse. Most of the time they seek the most well-preserved and intact dragon corpse they can get their hands on, and that's not exactly easy. Many powerful dragons leave behind a lot of their essence in the environment surrounding their final resting place. These areas can be rife with supernatural creatures and weirdness. They can have a warping effect on local natural wildlife, or weaken planar barriers and allow otherworldly creatures easier access to the prime material plane. For the evil dragons, this could mean demons and such. So let's get into the specific types. But first, some general traits of undead dragons. Undead dragons usually retain the general appearance of their living form. You can tell the skeleton of a black dragon from that of a bronze dragon, thanks to its size, structure, and the distinctive horn growth patterns of the different true dragon types. Even the incorporeal dragons exhibit these distinctive features most of the time. Undead dragons will have the same armor class and movement speeds, hit dice, damage immunities and resistances, number of attacks, dragon fear aura, and combat modifiers that they had in life, generally speaking. Legendary actions will remain mostly the same and often retain lair abilities. Some have their own version of regional abilities. This will only be for the most powerful forms of intelligent undead dragons. All undead dragons are immune to being charmed, held by magical means, or knocked unconscious, and almost never sleep. They may become dormant, but it's not exactly the same as sleeping, and this can have quite a drastic impact on their psychological state, as dragons sleep in a way more fundamental to their mental and physical state than little humanoids do. Undead dragons are subject to the ability of clerics to turn undead and can be damaged by holy water. Also, spells and rituals of protection from evil are usually quite effective against them. In some cases, even good aligned undead dragons suffer from these spells' effects, because the negative energy infusing and animating them reacts to the magic, despite the actual alignment of the dragon. This comes down to the impressive willpower of dragons. Other creatures of good alignment would almost always shift to an evil alignment after existing as undead for even a relatively short period of time. Undead dragons who retain sufficient intelligence can also make use of innate and learned spellcasting abilities that they had in life. Some undead dragons gain access to new innate spell-like powers thanks to their new form, and often can create and control lesser undead creatures themselves. If those responsible for raising the undead dragon survived the process, they may still have control over their creation and, through that dragon, have proxy control over a small horde of lesser undead. An attractive prospect for the power mad that leads many necromancers to a nasty end. The more intelligent undead dragon retain all of their memories that they had in life, but all of their emotions and motivations are no longer swayed by these memories. The curse of undeath constantly subjects them to torments and compulsions that are beyond the comprehension of living beings. In the case of vampiric dragons, it's very much like the hunger for blood is the only real part of the creature. Everything else is just an echo, a facade taken from the ravaged spirit and used as a tool in its constant hunt for victims. Vampires can be very convincing. You might believe there is even hope for them until you get within striking distance and the elaborate ruse is dropped and the true monstrous horror is fully revealed, moments before you meet a brutal and terrible end. Zombie dragons are the easiest form to create. Sometimes it's all that is left to a necromancer who has failed to raise a more powerful form of an undead dragon. All that's required is a relatively intact corpse. Any size or age category is fine. It doesn't matter much, the resulting undead dragon is little more than rotting flesh vehicle powered by an alien undead entity from the negative material plane. No part of the original dragon's spirit inhabits the zombie, so any magic that controls dragons, rather than undead, doesn't work at all. If the necromancer fails in their first attempt to raise a zombie dragon, they can attempt it again and again, just having to pause to rest, restock components and start over again. You can tell a dragon is a zombie rather than a dracolich because its eyes don't glow with that evil radiance. However, a clever necromancer could simply tear the eyes out of the corpse and put two gems enchanted with a light spell in there. 
I certainly wouldn't stick around for a closer look. Though the far more ponderous movements of a zombie dragon is also a dead giveaway. <clears throat> they require commands to operate, and they have zero deductive reasoning and do not react to anything, typically always going on the last turn in combat rounds. But they will have more hit points than the dragon had while it was alive and can take an impressive amount of damage before they basically fall apart. The 3.5 edition Draconomicon says that zombie dragons stink of death and its once glorious scaled hide sports gaping holes chewed by worms. Because of the creature's utter lack of intelligence, the instructions given to a newly created zombie dragon must be very simple, such as destroy anything that comes within sight. They are often used as sentries or guardians, with other forces coming to the sound of the zombie getting into battle with anything that sets it off. Evil dragons will sometimes create zombies out of their slain rivals and install them in parts of their lair where the stink is less of an issue. Usually zombie dragons can use the same breath weapon they had in life, but the damage is reduced by half. As always, with any massive pile of rotting meat and organs, there is the fun prospect of the zombie dragon being infested with rot grubs, its physical attacks transferring infectious diseases, and in the case of fire-breathing dragons, they may actually explode, as their body cavities are grossly swollen with flammable gases due to all the decomposition, and that explosion will be followed by a horrific cloud of stench. You often find zombie dragons under the thrall of powerful vampire dragons. In that case, the zombie dragons will be only fairly young and small. These juvenile dragons don't have enough power to transform into more advanced forms of undead when drained and killed by the vampire dragons. With dragon skeletons, in Fizban's Treasure of Dragons we have the constructs called the Dragon Bone Golems, which look a lot like regular animated dragon skeletons except for all the metal bindings and almost compulsory but unnecessary glowing runes and such that necromancers love to carve into those bones. The artwork in the book doesn't show that stuff, but I mean, when you look at the metalwork on that thing depicted, clearly whatever necromancer cobbled that together values function over form and doubtless has no time for those runes. The interesting thing about the Dragonbone Golem is that it draws its animating force from the magic innate to the bones themselves. Effectively, the whole thing is a draconic battery, almost devoid of intelligence but endowed with a very dangerous petrification breath weapon. I think it would be fun if a Dragonbone Golem could heal and repair itself by murdering other dragons, turning their flesh to stone, shattering that flesh off the underlying bones and then consuming the bones to restore and recharge their own power, perhaps even growing in size over time the more dragons they manage to kill. Undead dragon skeletons function as normal undead skeletons in most ways, but they retain a few of the draconic abilities and qualities even after death. Despite a dragon skeleton's loss of sentience, the pinpoints of red light smouldering in its eye sockets portray the spark of unlife that still exists. They can look a lot like a Dracolich for those who don't know exactly what to look for. They are not sapient and only do what they are ordered to do. Black dragons seem to get animated by such swamp dwellers as bullywugs and lizard folks quite a lot. The nickname for black dragons is skull or bone dragon anyway, so it fits nicely. The real trick to telling the difference between a Dracolich and a skeleton is that Dracoliches are always well past the adult stage of growth. And thanks to the organizations like the Cult of the Dragon and Draconic Necromancers, the remains of such large and mature dragons, even if they have been animated as skeletons, inevitably get abducted or purchased in order to create the far more powerful form of undead. This is not the case where the skeleton is animated from the bare minimum required. You see, while you need a complete dead dragon to create the more advanced undead, you only need the skull, spine and claws of a dragon to animate it as a skeleton. You can use any other bones to make up the rest of its body, and you can get fairly creative in some cases. Dragon skeletons can't fly, so it's not unheard of to create them with multiple limbs, almost appearing like an undead behir. Dragon skeletons have no breath weapon, but they still retain the special damage resistances they had in life according to their type, and they also retain their frightful presence ability. They rely on raw physical strikes, lashing out with their claws, bites, rakes with skeletal wings, and slicing through the enemies with whiplash tail strikes. The possibility of a dragon version of a bone claw undead is pretty gnarly. You can find the humanoid version of the bone claw for 5th edition D&D on page 121 of Morden Kanan's Tome of Foes. I think it's entirely possible that an attempt to create a Dracolich that fails could result in the creation of a bone claw dragon. Instead of its claws growing to frightful lengths, it's wings that become massive razor sharp and supernaturally extended weapons of murder 
The reach of its piercing wing strikes is over 60 feet. Targets struck get perforated and can just be tossed around by the bone claw dragon with enormous strength and ferocity. The, plus, the dragon exchanges the ability to fly with the shadow jumping ability of the bone claw instead. If it's in dim light or darkness, each creature of its choice within 10 feet of it must make a constitution saving throw or suffer damage from burst of necrotic energy, and the dragon then teleports from there to a location up to 120 feet away. Even able to bring a victim, it has grappled with its wing claws, as long as where it teleports to is also in dim light or darkness. The bone claw dragon is also intelligent enough to retain some of its innate spellcasting abilities. As for the unusual aspect of humanoid bone claws forming a bond with some sort of a master, this is almost never the case with bone claw dragons. The things are extremely difficult to deal with or control, and their lust for murder is limitless. Next we have the Ghoul and Ghast Dragon, created and sometimes really spontaneously rising from the intact remains of the most greedy and gluttonous dragons. It's a common trait with the intelligent undead dragons that their alignment and personality traits in life need to be at least a little similar to the undead monster they have become. So undead, pure-hearted and noble metallic dragons are very rare. It's almost always the red, white, black, topaz, deep, shadow, yellow and brown dragons that become intelligent undead, retaining some twisted version of their original spirit. Anyone who has faced creatures who can use paralysis in combat have good reason to be very worried about ghoul and ghast dragons. They have all of their claw, bite, tail and wing sweep attacks, can take legendary actions on other creatures' turns, and the ghast version has an extended cloud of sickening stench surrounding it that just adds to their dragon fear effect and the same sort of breath weapon attack they had when they were alive, only now it's fueled by consuming corpses. So the more they eat, the faster their breath weapons recharge. Ghoul and Gas Dragons would be indistinguishable for living dragons if it were not for their thick corpse stench odour, scabbed hide showing beneath their odd missing scale, and dull eyes, teeth and scales. The Morgue Dragon is one hell of a scary idea. I've not heard of any of them being statted up and included in any games, but it's well worth putting the idea into your head about the possibility. I can just imagine the disgusting viscera pulsating inside the Morgue Dragon's skeletal frame, some sort of chunky and squirming filth spray spewing out of the maw full of fangs ready to devour victims' remains. Hmm, I wonder if some sort of dragon devourer undead would be possible. The next step up the hierarchy of the undead is the wiked dragons. A wiked dragon spirit must inhabit a intact dragon corpse. However, the minimum of two weeks ritual casting required to prepare the body generally means that the animated body is in a state of advanced decomposition. Most are similar in appearance to a dragon zombie, except that they have glowing eyes and again, could be mistaken for a dracolich. The corpse must be of a dragon that was at least young adult in size and development. White dragons are best created from especially vicious or territorial evil dragons. The tattered wings of a white dragon do allow somewhat clumsy flight ability, but they do have the advantage of being able to fly non-stop, never running out of flight time if they need to stay in the air. This makes them a great mount for your discerning supreme evil overlord. These creatures are harmed only by magical weapons and are immune to cold. White dragons inflict normal claw and bite damage, but they also inflict an energy drain sickness on any victim who fails their saving throws. An intelligent living creature completely drained of life levels by a white can raise again, usually as a white as well, sometimes as a zombie. It's your choice, really. White dragons often retain any spellcasting abilities they had when they're alive, and while they tend to shun sunlight, it doesn't really harm them. Unlike the white dragons, hollow dragons found in Fizban's Treasure of Dragons are an undead class of dragons that seem to be restricted to metallic dragons. However, they're not always of a lawful or good alignment. They're still undead creatures who can be tyrannical and very destructive. Undeath in almost any form is inherently bad for reality. It's an unbalance of the natural order of things. In the case of the hollow dragon, they're driven by extreme willpower. Kind of like the humanoid undead called a revenant. They're a husk of a metallic dragon's hide filled with radiant energy. Depending on the dragon's original kind, that energy may take the appearance of flames, lightning or misty vapours. They are legendary creatures with all the abilities they had as living dragons and a whole slew of new abilities granted by the undead form, surging with huge amounts of supernatural elemental and radiant power. 
The effect they have on the environment around them is to both drain and immolate it. Each creature within 60 feet of the hollow dragon that it chooses to drain will have to make a wisdom save or have their speed halved and take disadvantage on all attack rolls until they manage to make their saving throw at the start of one of their turns. The hollow dragon can also generate ethereal strands of binding material to restrain targets. They can emit extremely loud thunder bursts and release an intense 60 foot cone of radiant flames. Finally, they are able to revive themselves after being reduced to zero hit points. Their energy snuffs out and they fall apart into nine pieces. Then a few days later, all the parts teleport back to where the head is located and the hollow dragon roars to life again, or some twisted version of it. Many hollow dragons only exist to perform a specific task, but some persist, driven by their extreme willpower and whatever obsessive mission they are focused on hour by hour, day by day. According to the Dragon Magazine article, in order to create a Wraith Dragon, a complete adult Dragon Corpse is necessary, though it may be in any condition, even skeletal. The more cunning and intelligent Dragon species are the most suitable for the creation of Wraith Dragons, so blues, greens, emeralds, sapphires, and cloud dragons are ideal. The ethereal Wraith Dragon is easily mistaken for a shadow dragon with glowing red eyes. Wraith dragons possess the same sort of abilities as a white dragon, but instead of draining energy from physical attacks, the wraith can unleash a black crackling breath attack of negative energy that conforms to the same area of effect as their former breath weapon type when they were alive. The breath weapon drains energy, and in 5th edition this means roll a saving throw or take a level of exhaustion, which is a vicious and cumulative impairment that can swiftly and surely murder the whole adventuring party if the Wraith Dragon manages to recharge and release that breath weapon multiple times in a single combat encounter. Unlike the White Dragon, Wraith Dragons are almost powerless in direct sunlight, so during the day they will hide out deep in their lair. Don't make the mistake of thinking that any sort of bright light has this effect on them. Ordinary bright light is harmless. They are only crippled by the light of the sun. We have an example of a Shadowfell type dragon in the Monster Manual, but they may also be the undead kind of Shadow Dragon. They have stats very similar to the Wraith or Spectre Dragon. A dragon has to be exceptionally evil and old to become a Spectre. The Shadow Dragons of the Fell Plains are most likely to undergo this transformation on their death or be the easiest to raise as this kind of undead. A Spectre Dragon appears to be a transparent, non-corporeal image of the dragon as it appeared in life. They drain energy just like the White and Wraith Dragons, which is bad enough, but their breath weapon is also incorporeal and will go right through solid barriers to burn and drain the soul of any creatures caught in its path. Those who die this way rise again as Wraiths and Spectres themselves. Ghost Dragons have a listing in Fizban's Treasury of Dragons. The most notable thing about them is that the ghostly version of their breath weapon takes the form of a 90-foot cone of terror-inducing mist. They can also freeze a victim solid. If they fail their save, they can also be badly frightened and they just cower there where they are, paralyzed and very vulnerable to the ghost dragon's freezing cold bite or necrotic claw attacks. The typical ghost dragons never travel very far from the remains of their treasure hoard, jealously guarding it in death, just as they did in life. Thankfully, ghost dragons don't have the outrageously overpowered possession power of regular ghosts. This actually makes a lot of sense, as dragon spirits are fairly incompatible with non-draconic life forms. But I think the game designers for 5th edition probably just thought the ghost dragon was dangerous enough as it is, and they're not wrong. All you have to do is combine a ghost dragon with a room trap that makes it very hard for the player characters to get away from that breath weapon, and they're screwed. Moving on, the mummy dragon can be raised after a total of 6 weeks of intense ritual spellcasting and the preparation of very expensive spell components that cost no less than 20,000 gold pieces. Mummy creation is an ancient process that predates the rituals to create a lich. In this case, the soul is bound to the enchanted wrappings encasing the corpse, trapping the dragon spirit inside its dead flesh, retaining its full intelligence and any spellcasting powers that it had, and also binding it to whatever special conditions are inscribed onto those magical wrappings. So this is why mummies have always been so vulnerable to fire. It's not just that their body, soaked in rare oils, herbs, and tree sap incense, is so flammable. It's the damage done to those enchanted wrappings, which is why they can be so swiftly destroyed, releasing their spirit finally. Mummy dragons are some of the oldest dragon undead that can be found. The ancient Imaskari certainly knew how to make them, and many lost ruins in the plains of purple dust are home to these terrible monsters, rising to murder any who dare to disturb their resting places. 
The bindings compel them to rise, but they never truly sleep. It's a terrible existence for a dragon spirit. Desert-dwelling dragons of an adult age or older are most commonly made into mummy dragons. This includes the blue, yellow, brass, sapphire, and brown dragons. Creating this type of undead actually takes longer than the six weeks of actual casting. First, an intact and reasonably fresh dragon corpse needs to be prepared by removing the internal organs for preservation in canopic jars. The body is desiccated in desert sands and preserved with an enchanted dust of dryness. Spells that destroy water are cast. Herbs, oils and saps are added. The resulting near skeletal body is held together by extremely strong and damage resistant withered flesh. The wings are no longer able to sustain flight and most of the scales flakes off in the process. The dragon still retains whatever its original armor class was in life. It has all the same immunities and vulnerabilities as a regular mummy lord from the Monster Manual for 5th edition. Mummy dragons are unlike humanoid mummies in that the wrappings are usually removed from the corpse after the ritual is complete, safely stored in a nearby phylactery. So the undead dragon is hard to immediately identify unless one has ever gotten a nose full of the smell of preservatives soaking a mummy corpse before, in which case they will know exactly what they are dealing with. The physically powerful mummy dragon gains plus three damage bonus to all physical attacks and its supernaturally potent fear aura forces any creature sighting a mummy dragon to make a wisdom saving throw or be affected by paralyzing fear, unable to take any actions for 1d4 rounds. The touch inflicts the same rotting disease as does a normal mummy, the infamous mummy rot. Those of you who are going to ask me if the fire immunity of a red dragon counters the vulnerability of fire a mummy usually has, yes, but... If a mummy dragon was originally immune to fire, it retains this immunity with respect to normal fire, but it's still subject to unmodified damage from magical fire. The breath weapon of a mummy dragon is a horrid 60 to 90 foot cone of virulent dust that inflicts tremendous narcotic damage equal to the damage done by an adult or ancient green dragon's breath weapon. Plus, the victims are also forced to make a constitution save against being cursed with mummy rot. A cursed victim can't regain hit points, and their hit point maximum is reduced by 10 points for every 24 hours that pass without them making their saving throw versus the curse or someone casting remove curse on them. If the victim dies from this, they simply crumble into a pile of dust that prevents them being raised from death by anything less than a resurrection spell. Ongoing effects in 5th edition are fairly toothless though, and it's unlikely a player will roll so badly so often as to suffer this fate, but non-player characters are under the DM's control. You don't need to roll saving throws for NPCs, by the way. <laughs> you just decide if they're going to serve as examples of the horrible fate of those cursed by the dragon mummy. <laughs> A lot of viewers have asked me about the vampire dragons. Also, I have a video on Draculiches that I'll be updating at some point, so the vampire dragon will be our final entry in this video. With the exception of the Draculich, no undead dragon is feared more than a vampire dragon. They are best created from the most ancient and evil, chaotic and powerful dragon species available. So reds, whites, deep shadow and yellow dragons. The appearance of a vampire dragon is identical to that of a living dragon, and the monster's true nature is often revealed only when its special powers are employed. Though these dragon species are already known for their arrogance, cruelty, and overbearing ego, those traits are even more exaggerated in vampire dragons, who are well aware of the measure of their true power. Due to their might and overwhelming desire to dominate those around them, vampire dragons are difficult to control and very rarely created by even the most practiced of necromancers who are not totally insane. So, eh. Vampire dragons possess all of the normal powers of their particular dragon type, including breath weapon and spellcasting ability. They are very strong, however, and also gain a plus two bonus to damage inflicted by any of the physical attacks. They consume living victims in order to power their breath weapon and to feed their endless hunger for limitless lakes of fresh living blood. I can't stress enough that vampires in Dungeons and Dragons are old school. They are not romantic, tragic anti-heroes. They may act like they are in order to convince a well-meaning person that they are safe to just give a little bit of blood that the vampire needs to survive. <laughs> then the monster will drain the victim dry and pretend to feel remorse about it. They don't. They just hate the victim for not having more blood in them. A D&D &D dragon vampire will never, never willingly stop in the middle of feeding in order to not kill its victim, unless they have a very evil reason for doing so that makes them even more of a horrible monster. 
Vampire dragons draw much of their power directly from the negative material plane. When they are feeding on their victims, the vitality of the blood flows through them and drains away into the negative plane. The dragon is not really powering up on that vitality. They don't retain it. They are instead generating power by feeding that funnel of negative energy, and this requires a constant fuel, hence why they can never feel satisfaction of that hunger. The more they feed, the more they want to feed, and the more charged with negative energy they become. They have all of their draconic powers and attacks, as well as all the abilities of a vampire spellcaster, as found on page 298 of the Monster Manual for 5th edition. And they combine their draconic regional effects with those of the vampire, so infestations of bats, rats and wolves, clinging fogs and mists, withered plants and a marked increase in transient populations of fortune tellers with crazy beautiful daughters and hedge mafia fathers and brothers who are remarkably capable at knife fighting and acquiring any merchandise if the price is right. You've all watched the cheesy old movies. Personally, I'm into the non-player character who shows up with a trunk full of garlic and sharpened wooden ballista bolts who is actually a specialist in killing both vampires and dragons. That's one hell of a pastime. The one thing you have to be very wary of is that vampire dragons, while retaining their usual form of breath weapon, also have an additional vampire breath weapon. This takes the form of their usual type, but it's pitch black and reeks of rotten blood. It also inflicts a level of exhaustion on any being caught in it who fail their saving throw, and they can unleash it a total of three times per day as one of their legendary actions. Thankfully, vampire dragons have all the usual vulnerabilities as regular vampires. Instead of transforming into gas and returning to their coffin when it's reduced to zero hit points, the dragon vampire returns to the location of its treasure hoard where it slowly reforms its physical body. The vampire dragon always hides its hoard carefully and leaves it guarded by other powerful forms of undead that serve its dominant will. They usually use their powers of enchantment to control leaders and influences in any populations around them, sowing fear, violence and hate in order to weaken their victim's ability to rise up as one people against them. They also take the most respected, cherished and loved, often the most attractive and heroic members of those populations, and enthrall them as a demonstration that resistance to their power is utterly futile. Vampire dragons are very evil, possibly even eviler than dragon liches. Well, maybe. The Dragon Magazine article finishes with this to say on using undead dragons in your D&D campaigns, and I quote, Three basic methods serve for the introduction of undead dragons to a campaign. The first method assumes that the knowledge required to create these nightmares has been forever lost, but that a few of these undying creatures still lurk among ancient ruins or in deep caverns. Character parties, to their credit or chagrin, might discover these oddities rather unexpectedly. This might be a once in a career event, or a campaign could be built around the premise whereby the party comes into possession of a faded tome that hints as to the location and general nature of other undead dragons that were created at the behest of an evil order of necromancers or an extinct religious cult. Some of these lairs, once they are found, might contain nothing but an odd trap or two among the mouldering bones and dust. Others will likely still have their guardians still in residence, along with whatever treasures, magical or mundane, that the creators thought worth guarding. The more powerful undead dragons have the ability to create undead servitors, and these would certainly complicate the situation. An opposing school of thought assumes that the science of animating undead dragons is relatively new, but with the field being steadily advanced by a secret society like the Cult of the Dragon. New types of undead dragons would slowly begin to appear uh, in the campaign, plaguing institutions dear to the player characters, who must discover the abilities and weaknesses of an increasing variety of undead dragon types. Eventually, the evil masterminds responsible for setting loose these abominations must be found and neutralized. Their records must be destroyed or put in safekeeping so that none may repeat their unholy experimentation. A DM might also desire a mix of the two options, with the player character's enemies having discovered and gained control of a number of undead dragons that have survived the ages since the practice of their creation was more common. Not only must the players battle these foes and their newfound undead allies, but they may also rest assured that these necromancers or unholy priests are working to rediscover the lost art of undead dragon creation through current research and by seeking out the ancient tomes that detail these ghastly practices. The player characters might travel near and far in a race to obtain this lost lore before it falls into the proverbial wrong hands. And should they fail, well, they fight the good fight or the epic bad fight and roll up some new characters with another great story about how their character died horribly, tucked away for prosperity in your horde of dandy anecdotes. 
Over the decades, I've always tend to remember the times uh, characters died well, rather than characters who lived and just accomplished their quests. Feel free to discuss undead dragons and undead creatures in general in the comments down below the video. If you have any suggestions for further dragon related topics for me to cover, I'm always happy to take viewer requests. If you like what I do, consider supporting the channel with a like, a subscription, hit the bell to get the notifications, become a patron or subscribe star supporter, become a member of the YouTube channel, or buy a t-shirt from my spring merch store. And there is currently some big pocket silicon battle mats and accessories in stock. Links down below. Use the code GLUESTICK for a special deal. All purchases help support my work. Thanks for watching. And as always, I'll be back with more RPG lore for you very soon.